Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Uh, happy International Women's Day. Thank you to Behrouz for inviting me and for the, to the center for hosting me today. Um, so I'll just get started. Um, my talk is called Dislocated Modernism, the Interstices of Mythology and Destruction in the Works of Bahman and Moasis. And it's um, part of uh, a broader research project on uh, 20th century modernism in Iran in the wake of the coup and the ways various aesthetic mediums um, sort of incorporated this uh, traumatic event into the actual forms of the mediums themselves. Um, so minotaurs, bodies without limbs, fish out of water, severed, severed heads and faceless countenances. These are the images that recur in the paintings of the late modernist artist Bahman and Moasis. Mohassis's corpus includes a collection of paintings, sculptures, and collages which span 60 years. His work maintained a dialogic and often subversive relationship with local conditions and state-led institutions, as well as mo modernist canons, local and international. Where the Pahlavi regime's tactics of rapid modernization aimed to develop a rhythm of order, continuity, and progress, the post-coup period that toppled Mossadegh produced a traumatic uncertainty in the political, historic, and psychic ground of the nation. It is because of Mohassas's engagement with the traumatic uncertainty of post-coup conditions in Iran that his work tends to be ill-served by historicist frameworks that attempt to assign it a, a role in an unfolding order of development of either self, society, or national tradition. As an artist who maintained a radical resistance to state or national narratives of his work, Mohassas's corpus could not easily be co-opted by national movements or modern, modernis, of modernism or schools of modern art, such as the contemporary Saqqa Khana arts movement, nor can it easily be relinquished to a European-inspired canon. His corpus and his relationship to it shattered cohesive notions of canon formation and linear art historical narratives altogether. This is exemplified in his compulsion to destroy his work, leaving little to posterity except scattered remains. To write on Bahman and Moasis is to conduct detective work, to contend with a scattered timeline, missing details, and a corpus largely destroyed or hidden in private collections. With these disparate pieces, I work with the remains Moasis has left us, not to construct a conclusive narrative of his work, but rather to open on to the aesthetic, political, and psychic questions his works present. Critic Jalal Ala Ahmad described Mohassas's central imagery, often eyeless humans or gasping fish, as deformed by stone and pressure, as if having just escaped from a vice grip or posing before the camera of your eye to preserve their honor. Literary critic, and historian Esan Yashater saw elements of protest and satirical metaphor in Moasis's deformed shapes and disfigured monsters. Meanwhile, art critic Enrico Crispolti identified the atemporal quality of Moasis's portrayal of human figures, drawing attention to the way in which they are not bound to a single temporal moment. Crispolti remarks upon the recurrence of male figures in Moasis's corpus, who were both imbued with a material force while also exhibiting a sense of disfiguration. In this talk, Moasses' process of what I refer to as figural abstraction, which can be discerned even prior to the 1953 coup amid the theoretical debates of avant-garde figures who cast, cast doubt on the desirability of mythological narration as a component of visual art in Iranian society. I am interested in the terms of Moasis' engagement with the long durée of post-coup conditions, character characterized by an atmosphere of defeat and destruction. To address the ways in which these conditions permeate the formal quality of, uh, qualities of Moasis' work, my analysis surveys the multiple meanings of myth and mythology as both a force of violence, as well as a structure of tem temporal and symbolic recurrence that informed his practice and led to a deployment of destruction as a creative medium. Mohassas was drawn to the atemporal structural of mythical reference that span ancient and contemporary times 
and employs recurrent symbols as malleable and permeated with tension rather than as signs to be decoded. His paintings resemble stone as though molded by the hands of a sculptor. Mythological figures are changeable and function as both subjects and subjecting forces of the 20th century atmosphere of violence that surrounds them. As such, the reappearance of recurrent motifs from minotaurs to fish not only comment on form, but enact a critical attention to destruction as a world historical phenomenon and a recurrent aesthetic and political force. Carving space amid the art historical and political pressures of his time, Mohastas' corpus emerges at the interstices of mythology and destruction. Mohastas' I will just go to the next slide. Moestas' pre-revolutionary sculptures and paintings move between the temporal and aesthetic practices of myth-making and destruction as two parallel movements that reflected an anti-authoritarian commitment. At times, Moestas directly, directly invokes figures of Greek mythology or draws on its symbols as a form of legible iconography. As theorists of myth have identified, the category of myth developed from the Persian and Greek traditions as a set of heroic stories to the association between myth and fabulation, and later in the 19th and 20th century, with the emergence of nation states, myth would support the founding origin stories of nationalism. Mohastas's formal experimentations confront the political and specifically ideological undercurrent of myth as a multi-layered structure that solidifies the founding narratives of nationhood and state leaders, and contains a repetition and congealing power that violently works to maintain such myths across time. Building from the work of Talal Assad, who explores a theory of myth and mythology, I identify in Mohassas' work a critical engagement with myths, multiple meanings as a structure of violence, but also as a shifting iconography in which symbols can carry multiple meanings across time and geography. Mohassas' invocation of recurrent symbols in Greek myth mythology is neither a representational index nor a reflection of a traumatic event. For this reason, my discussion of myth and mythology traces various forms of myth, including the myth-making practices of the state and um, that aim to create order and preservations, as well as mythopoetics that reflects a critical process that undermines those very structures. The mythopoetic symbols in Mohassas' work generate a temporality of active unfolding and rest on the tensions and disjunctures that are expressed in symbols and scenes. Real and imaginary signifiers serve as mirrors, not in terms of direct symbolic meanings, but as expressive forms, paradoxical and changing, that move between abstraction and figuration. Key examples in his cor corpus of what I describe as figural abstraction are exemplified in two crucial paintings produced in the 60s, Fifi Howls from Happiness and Head One. Head One is part of a series of five small paintings in which Mohasses depicts a number of singular abstracted heads with no distinguishing facial markings beyond a crude pair of eyes that remain in the realm of an intimation. The painting's key characteristic is its textured stone-like quality and color resembling a freestanding sculpture that, resemble, that emerges from rubble. Colored as though distressed by the marks of time, the sculpture is placed against a monochromatic gray background. This series displays Mohassas' interest in the face, while at the same time reflecting a radical departure from the iconicity of classical facial representations. The, the icon here retains its bare form while becoming abstracted from its distinguishing features. In Fifi, Mohassas' treasured painting, which he carried everywhere with him, the artist's play with the figural and the abstract is established as central to his occupation with psychic interiority and the external human form. Fifi's figuration is characterized by its intense red color set against a green background and a bodily form is shaped by rudimentary lines, stark use of color, missing limbs, and lack of expressive features. By, by reducing the human form to its barest shape, Mohassas draws attention to its primal qualities. The bounds between animal and human are blurred by naming Fifi a creature, creature who howls. Fifi reveals both a character named and unknown, 
Who is Fifi? Fifi howls. Fifi's howl is declared, but its source remains an enigma enigmatic question. Why does Fifi howl? And how does this ho howl manifest happiness? In contrast to head number one, which features suggestive facial markings upon a figure already calcified, Fifi is a red figure whose face is almost entirely filled by a dark cavity in which markings and expressive features are invisible. Interestingly, while the source of Fifi's howl is left unclear, the void in the dark rimmed orifice recalls Lacan's discussion of the mouth as a drive that cannot be satiated. Furthermore, in a Freudian register, the mouth is itself a significant orifice, the medium through which the unconscious dream is articulated and sub subsequently becomes open to interpretation. Understood from these psychoanalytic perspectives, the mouth is not only Fifi's character, is not only not only Fifi's characteristic feature, but also at once the perpetual void of the drive, the dream, and the nightmare. There is no doubt then that Fifi invokes both visual and acoustic registers of the unconscious, bridging the psychic ambiguity of a dark cavity with the figural distinction of a mouth that howls mysteriously from happiness. Fifi remains one of Moasis' most famous works, both for its striking imagery, but also because of the artist's stated psychic affinity with Fifi. The human, animal, and monstrous figure return as central subjects across Moasis' work. And as, I'm going, as I will show, Moasis' use of disfiguration reflects on destruction as an operative atmospheric force, but also as a medium through which life after the coup is understood. This is just an interesting photo of um, Bahman and Moasses and Jalal Ali Ahmad and Simin Danishvar um, in Rome that I thought I had to show. <laughs> Among the works in his mostly anti-naturalistic corpus, there are a few realist portraits that stand out. One in particular a portrait of Mohammed Mossadegh, the former prime minister of Iran. The portrait of Mossadegh is dated 1952, one year before the coup that toppled him and sent him into exile. The portrait, while seemingly conforming to a straightforward mode of pictorial representation, in comparison to Moasses' later works in collage, figure, figural abstract painting, and anti-statuary sculpture, is nevertheless significant for its rare choice of subject. It is perhaps not hard to imagine the fascination Mossadegh may have held for Moasis. In 1952, given the success of Mossadegh's parliamentary election the year prior, his images were widely circulating in the streets and newspapers of Iran and around the globe. And you see here his um, Time Magazine Person of the Year in 1951. An image seen like the one here was not uncommon in popular media, and for a young emerging artist involved in the political and intellectual scene at the time, its realist depiction might not be worth remarking. In fact, the realist portrayal of Mossadegh, which almost appears to replicate a journalistic or media image, is in sharp contrast to Moasses' later approach to human figuration which includes heads without bodies, faces with no expressive features, and shapeless figures dislocated from their surroundings. And yet, even as this starkly mimetic portrait of Mossadegh stands in contradistinction to his remaining corpus, a closer inspection of the painting reveals not only Mohassas' attunement to aesthetic deconstruction and psychic attunement, but also his political concerns, characterized by the political potential of what Mossadegh could bring for Iran's future and the critical anxieties that come with placing so much hope on a single heroic figure. In an autobiographical essay included in a monograph of his works, Mohassas retrospectively describes the significance of the political moment in which Mossadegh was, was in the process of nationalizing the Iranian oil fields. And he writes, there was no time for studying because the streets consumed us. He describes an atmosphere of artistic and cultural ferment, and he mentions being in deep intellectual and artistic contact with a number of figures, including the poet Nima Yushij, the Cubist painter Jali Ziyapur, the Dada poet Hushang, Goshi, Hushang Irani, and the Marxist social theorist Khalil Maleki, among others. <laughs> 
Within his stylized autobiography, as though the interruption in the text mirrors the interrup interruption of artistic momentum at the time, Moasis cuts into his description of the cultural scene to announce the political rupture that bore multiple effects across Iran's political, social, and aesthetic trajectories, the coup. He writes, with the US-backed overthrow of Mossadegh, it was all over. And thereafter, Moasis left Iran for Italy in 1954 to enroll at the Rome Arts Academy, where he studied the works of European modernists like Pablo Picasso, Francis Bacon, Henry Moore, and Marino Marini, among others. At the age of 14, Moasis studied painting with Muhammad Habib Mohammadi, a painter who had studied at the Moscow Art Academy. Before his time abroad, he attended Tehran University's Faculty of Fine Arts and spent his early 20s involved in Tehran's avant-garde circles, uh, e even publishing with uh, Jungya Esfahan. In addition to his long-ranging work in painting, sculpture, and collage, he also uh, produced a number of literary transitions, uh, translations of the work of Italo Calvino, Jean Genet, and Eugene Unesco into the Persian language, and also the theat theatrical stage um, in Tehran. His work always involved the convergence of formal mediums, including figural paintings that drew from the bodily shape of the sculptural form to sculptures that spoke less to the conventional volume of the form than to a delicate and humble bodily representation. By cultivating an aesthetic practice that worked across and between mediums, often bringing, bringing the sculptural into his painting and vice versa, Moasis disordered the conventions of each medium and reflected a permeability of forms. It can also be said that this sensibility toward, towards disorder is formed by historical and political affliction that emerged from both an international, internal and external invasion and the critical effects it produces. It is therefore meaningful to track the events of 1952 and 1953 as a wound that emanates in disordered ways within the broader context, context of his corpus and fomented an anti-ideological political stance that permeated Mohassas' relationship to the norms of mediums, artistic conventions, and art historical canons. Specifically, it was his own attunement to the psychic residues of the coup that led him to produce works that prioritized psychic effects over and above previous standards or artistic categories. In this portrait of Mossadegh, the prime minister faces an angle, faces at an angle, looking away from the direct gaze of the audience. The painting resembles an exact reproduction of a formal photograph that would be seen in a contemporary newspaper. Mohassas then places Mossadegh's figure against a collage of textile and territory into a fresco-like backdrop that fades into the lines of Mossadegh's head. Placed against the Iranian flag, Mossadegh is enveloped by the symbol of nationalism. Beside the flag is an unmarked map representing Iran's struggle to attain control over its oil, a struggle Mossadegh is understood to represent both nationally and internationally. In 1952, when this painting was produced, Mohassas was 21 years old and among many young intellectuals and emerging artists who believed in the vision of democracy and national sovereignty for which Mossadegh stood. While Mossadegh is himself illuminated in the painting, the use of collage results in a more complicated representation of his heroism. Just as both the flag and topography of Iran are fragmented by the edge of the canvas, suggesting an excess to the dimension of the canvas, Mossadegh's portrait carries a sense of temporal imminence, of a project not yet completed, which is further amplified by the subject's gaze. Rather than totally mythologizing him as others did in this historical moment or continue to do so in the present, the painting emplaces Mossadegh in a shifting of idea of what he's responsive to and what he's responsible for. In contrast to this portrait, which retains connection to a specific time and place, Mohassas' later post-coup works are marked by an aesthetics of dislocation and focus on subjects suffering from alienation, violence, and the afflictions produced by systems and humans alike. And I included these just to give you some kind of key examples of the Saqqa Khana arts movement, which um, Moasis is really, you know, working not against, but, you know, in contrast to at the same time. <laughs> 
In an aphorism, Moasis wrote in Italian, sculpture is pure truth. With sculpture, I have always made anti-statuary. Moasis rejects the statural, invoking the statue's more conventional and enduring qualities. In Italian, the etymological definition of statua is something that stays still and stands upright. Moasis's rendering of the royal family approaches the form by maintaining the dignity of the human figure without deification. The monumental sculpture rejects creating an eternal mythic statue of a state leader whose legacy was bound up in repetitive acts of violence in his own reign, as well as the extended reign of Iranian history. To produce a sculpture that is, as Moasis professes, anti-statuary suggests a resistance to the congealing power of state monuments that leave their mark for the forgetfulness of future generation. The state intends to leave an enduring mark of its legacy, a myth by way of its meaning as both story of endurance and as a fiction that traps the horrors of the states in its commanding force. An analysis of Moasis' state-commissioned sculptural productions of the 60s pos positions his work outside the state's effort of mythologizing its own power, instead emphasizing other powerful myths of nature and destruction. These are important dialogical engagements marked by the specificity of Iran's modernist movement, which developed concurrently with national modernization projects permeating educational, artistic, and architectural spheres. The Queen Farah Tiba commissioned Mohasses for multiple pieces in the 60s and 70s, including a large sculpture of the royal family, um, which is displayed here. Although Mohasses accepted the commission, he did so by questioning the conventions of power in the sculptural form, ultimately creating a sculpture that the royal family chose not to display. While size and magnitude are constitutive features of monumental statues intended to memorialize state figures, Mohassas's rendering of the royal family is on, is on the upper end of conventions for public statuary, appearing almost monstrous in size. The sun's physical presence, however, is represented as a strange figure, both large and small, altering the viewer's sense of perception in enigmatic ways. The sun appears as a child with an adult torso and childlike limbs. His clothes appear too small as though he has outgrown them and yet his face is flat with little emotional expression. The child carries a conjunction of growth patterns jarring the cycle of biological development and suggested, suggestive of an arrested cycle of reproduction. Moasas' sculpture is therefore no mere statue of mythological power. It is a form that carries the movements of arrestedness and growth, destruction and mythology, as well as the, as the psychic anxieties of the royal family. By mobilizing the sculptural median's emphasis on bodily figuration and perception, Moasis pushed the form beyond its limits by interrogating the interiority of the royal family, laying bare its psychic fractures. Rather than representing them as strong and regal, unaffected mythic figures that stand outside of time, Moasis gave the royal family expressive features of worry, fear, and concern grounding the monument in a temporal moment in which the Shah was losing grip over the nation. By rendering the psychic world of the royal family, Moasis puts forth an image of the biologically fa biological family as internally disintegrated by creating a marked distance between the Shah and the queen and their son. Building from the grandeur of monumental sculptures, the Shah is depicted as a teratoid figure, situated in stark contrast. He is seen gripping his coat and looking down, the queen facing the opposite direction, worried that her son would not become king. The royal family was of course discontent with this production and the statue was never exhibited. By accepting the state commission, Moasis did not accept its prescribed ideals, Rather, he aimed to produce a sculpture that directly confronted the state, an encounter that assumes a relationship with destruction both prior to the sculpture's creation and after it was shared with the royal family. When charged with the possibility that the work might be destroyed by the state, Moasis replied, you have so many soldiers, if you want to destroy it, ask them to come destroy it. The temporal abstraction of the monument as a structure that exists throughout time to capture the grandeur of a state figure is upended here. 
a technique that borrows from the expressionistic elements of painting and draws them into sculpture's capacity for figural and facial expression. His aphorism on anti-statuary sculpture should be contextualized within a corpus that approaches the technical facets of the medium to produce an art that is fundamentally opposed to repressive forces of power. That is, they embodied an expressiveness not typically felt or experienced in the static conception of monumental sculptures as enduring, stable, and timeless. Muhammad Reza Shah, famously referred to by his follow followers in godlike terms, um, and these terms, which circulated throughout the Shah's reign, were meant to produce a sense of the Shah as both divine and celestial, as well as rooted in the nation and country. The Shah, compared to a godlike figure, becomes ever present and an eternal facet of the nation. Instead, Mu'assas produces a sculpture as, as a sublunary human, lacking control and fearful of his fate. In an aphoristic statement uh, about the repetitive cyclicality of repressive state leaders in Iran, Moasis wrote, they used to have Aryahmer, they replaced him with Ayatollah. They only know the A from the alphabet. His sculptural production rejects any variety of icon worship. And this chosen engagement with the royal family was therefore also a negotiation with the mythologizing tendencies of the state as well as the repetitive structures that replace state leaders with others, reflecting a form devoid of content. This chosen engagement with the royal family was therefore also a, ne a negotiation with the mythologizing tendencies of the state and the repetitive structures that re replace state leaders with others. Mohassas's anti-statist sensibility also permeates his work in painting, which even more than his sculptures, created fractured figures without the expressive features of representational figuration. To inform my reading, um, I, I look at the way uh, Talal Asad discusses myth and mythology. Asad traces several mutations in the discourse around myth, one being a transformation of the opposition of the sacred and profane into a new opposition between imagination and reason. To explicate the development of this binary, Asad quotes Marcel Letien, saying that exclusionary procedures multiply in the discourse of the science of myths, born on a vocabulary of scandal that indicts all figures of otherness. Mythology is on the side of the primitive, the inferior racers, the people of nature, the language of origins, children, savagery, mad madness, always the other, as the excluded figure, and shows how reason was endowed with the task of defining myth in the human imagination. Theorists have used the term mythopoetics to consider the forms of aesthetic expression that rests on an assembly of mythic symbols or practices of myth, myth making. Mythopoetics is, as Chris Ravetto argues, not a practice where such analogies become forms of representation, but rather in contrast to the symbolic meanings making of myth, mythopoetic calls attention to the disjuncture, doubling and instability in the practice of analogy itself. Moasis's corpus is shaped um, by critically probing the features of life that often rest outside of these narratives, grotesque figures, parasitical invasions, and decaying natural life. These subjects hinge, bet hinge between the boundaries of life and death and call upon the viewer to dwell in the interstices of mythology and destruction. Assad's critique of myth relieves our discussion of myth from discourses that label, label it as religious or irrational, as well as processes of unmasking that simply seek to expose the pervasiveness of secular mythologies and modern ways of seeing and understanding the world. I follow this opening of myth to suggest that artists like, like Moasses turn to myth to employ its power as a recurrent form that entails a temporal quality of endurance and familiarity of signs, rather than as a predetermined icon that requires decoding. This understanding of myth is more closely related to the link between recurrent figures and a register of time, where the invocation of mythic figures is not used to create order out of the present, but as a means of laying bare the recurrence of figures that disrupt or dislocate the time in which they surface. The symbols on the canvas do not need to be made transparent by the rational eye, but can enable a place in which creation can meet the place of action, a place of uncertainty and even at times unknowability.
to create a new mythology for Mu'assis becomes a critical practice with what begins in Iran but transpires onto an international scene, the petrified landscape produced by state power. Mu'assis allows the viewer to engage with nature as an embattled ground, not merely in the modernist binary between technology and nature, but rather by approaching nature in its hardened state. Mu'assis considers the role of nature as a carrier of wounds afflicted by the world around it, even if the affliction remains invisible. Many of Moasis's smaller sculptures defy the force of volume by rendering the figure as slender and enfolding onto itself as a means of undermining sculptural conventions. His paintings, on the other hand, are saturated with other elements of sculpture, including gray tones, gouache textures, and bodies and figures that resemble stone. The use of sculptural textures in his paintings attaches a mythic sensibility to his subjects, even while they often represent maniacal or weakened figures. This sculptural drive in his paintings counters the mythologizing force of the sculptural as heroic, while also manipulating the medium's materiality as one that carries a temporal reference either through fracture, decay, and deterioration. In both pers um, Personaggio I and Elmo Antico, Moasis puts forth figures that are at once anthropomorphic and extraterrestrial, dislocating the painting from a sense of place, while at the same time generating a feeling of the archaic in the, and the modern. Personaggio depicts a faceless head against a flattened horizon line split between black and red, the flattened surface eliminates a sense of distance and depth. Instead, both land and sky are given a sense of central immediacy in the face of the viewer. The head is defined by darkened lines that frame the subject, while also illuminating its presence as the central image. In place of an eye, the head is marked by a pinkish gray, evoking a chipped sculpture rotting from the inside. Mohassas's series of faceless heads at once, the, at once create the sense of a fetus that is yet to develop its limbs and a rotting corpse. This sense of archaic realism is further developed in Elmo Antico, which again features an illuminated faceless head against a, a dark backdrop. The black background contains an etching of a thinly traced red suit of armor, an invocation of Greek mythology, particularly red figure pottery, an important stylistic feature of great Greek figural drawing. The etching almost fades into the darkness of the background as it frames the faceless limb that obtrudes from the bottom of the canvas, again, as though it extends beyond. In this painting, there is a meeting of multiple mythologies. Although it is a faceless limb, a figure of stunted or spoiled possibility that takes the center stage as the recurring mythic structure in this series. As one can note in Personaggio, the painting is divided into deep red tones that abruptly split into dark black gray. The stark background appears as a cosmic backdrop to the mythic qualities of nature and nature as myth. The stone-like protrusion recalls the excavation of a fossil, but it is not merely a stone marked by the past, but what D.D. Huberman identifies in the art history of Abby Warburg as a residue accompanied by a dream wish, in such a way that a buried fragment, a fossil, take on the tensions proper to the future. Elmo Antico presents a curious arrangement of time with the faceless head whose time is left ambiguous and the terracotta trace of Greek figural drawing in the black backdrop. These converging figures indicate what Freud calls the indestructible nature of the unconsci unconscious material, drawing the time of each image into the time of immediacy. As D.D. Huberman discusses, the emphasis on plastic figuration in Warburg's work does not mean that an abstract idea has found a good visual metaphor or a literary image, as in hermeneutic symbols. It means, rather, that a certain quantity of energy has become embodied through the sedimentation of time, has become fossilized, and yet has preserved all of its power of movement, of transforming itself. This meditation on temporal and energetic aspects of fossilization and the movement it preserves illuminates Mohassas's stylistic, 
which uses paint to construct visual images that recall the fossilized stru structures of sculpture, while at the same time emphasizing trace, residue, and eruption. These psychic elements give the structures of fossilization a capacity to move and speak across time. Key in Moassas' mythological repertoire is the Minotaur, a figure of Greek mythology embodied by a monstrous form with a reputation for violence and destruction. Mohassas' invocation of mythical figures who embodied the state of being in flux builds from Picasso's gravitation towards classical mythological figures, which Mohassas describes as, simultaneous, um, as a simultaneous destruction and pre preservation of the human form. He wrote, Picasso chose figures of classical mythology who were in a constant state of metamorphosis, minotaurs, centaurs, scythians, and fauns. Moassas did not invoke familiar sim symbolic reference with the intent of entering a representational code of art historical reference, but rather draws on the mythic endurance of the Minotaur to invoke a long history of authoritarianism, a figure that is in itself in flux. The Minotaur's figural composition as a hy hybrid human monster allows the viewer to reflect on power, authority, and violence as a threat both immediate and in transition. By rendering these mythological figures in an active scene of violence expressed through metamorphosis or violent encounter, the Minotaur functions only as a symbol with a, pre with a predetermined meaning, but comes to live in a radical temporality in which all history is present. In this image, the monster is not only the force of power, but a figure that is itself possessed. The monstrosity of the recurring figure of the Minotaur across Moassas' work is interested in this aberration of human form, as well as the ways in which monstrosity constitutes an annihilation of the limits of form by expanding beyond its normative order. In The Minotaur Scares the Good People, Moassas depicts a Minotaur facing a group of people, marked by a sense of fear. The expression of fear in the people's face is portrayed by open mouths so wide that they almost take up the entire head, appearing as black circles. The curious emphasis on the expanded abyss-like mouth renders the petrification of the scene through a simplified technique of abstraction rather than through precise fe facial features. The bodies are animated by a sense of movement with various limbs moving in multiple direction, giving the the viewer a sense of temporality of crisis in which direction is altogether disordered. The sense of urgency is amplified with the motion um, of the mother holding her child. Um, and there is un undoubtedly an encounter between the Minotaur and the fearful people on the other side, but what to make of their aesthetic similarity? The people are not to depicted as figurally realist or representationally whole, but as limbless, truncated bodies, just as the Minotaur is depicted in, morphological, in a morphologically expanded sense. In an essay entitled The Human Altamira, Moassas examines Picasso's relationship to time and the way in which his art generates a mirror onto the pervasive violence of the 20th century. According to Mohassas, Picasso used destruction, kharab kardan, as his central, as his central medium and method, and through which to explore the here and now of the contemporary moment. In describing Picasso, Mohassas writes, rebellious individual whose social interactions, private life, and artistic purpose involved one thing, to destroy. But destruction, as Mohassas conceives of it, is not unilaterally imposed. Rather, it involves a process of negation that motivated 20th century modernists. For Mohassas, Picasso's destruct destructive tendency is also an act of creation. Picasso, the destroyer and creator. Through this shared understanding of destruction, both Picasso and Mohassas produce figures in their works that express, express both dream and nightmare. Mohassas reflects on Picasso's rendering of the human form and the way it enacts this creative destruction. Picasso disfigured the image of the human figure he tore it apart, but he did not eliminate it. 
This act of destruction mirrored an act of abstraction, an abstraction that rendered the critical and psychic realities of the moment. And as Moasses expressed, this was necessary because reality itself was never enough. This resulted in figures whose bodies were formed by excesses or death, bodies of another world, but were indeed closer to the psychic realities of the present than any realist depiction. In this regard, if we are to locate the affinities of Moasis's work with Picasso's, it would not be because of a shared set of symbolic, re symbolic reference, but because of a shared vision towards the otherworldly and the way in which it reveals the violence and destruction that characterize local and global contexts from the Spanish Civil War, the 1953 coup, the killing of Martin Luther King, and so on. And this is Moasis's work that he um, made in honor of Martin Luther King. Moasis saw himself as creating works within a legacy of global modernists and cultivated a narrative of himself and his work that was neither sedimented nor structured like the monumental images of the state. When writing his will, Moasis made sure that none of his remaining works would be given, gifted to state institutions, whether Iranian or Italian. His corpus represents a radical tension between a desire to create and to be part of history with a capital H, while at the same time carrying a proclivity towards destruction. Some of Mohassis's supposedly destroyed works were later found and sold in March 2021, proving to be very much alive and intact. This falsity reveals that even beyond the material destruction, Moasis created a narrative ambiguity, one that did not lend itself to simple recovery in either national or art historical narratives. And this material and embodied destruction in his work is fundamentally a political and a historical act that defies the reductive categories of canon formation as well as those of state ideology. The confrontation with the state's violent motor of destruction is what propels Mohasses to respond with his own. When asked what he thought would come of his remaining works, the artist replies, I don't think about it. If they're destroyed, shattered, stolen, or whatever, it's, an, it's a victory of the ignorance of these times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donna, for this incredible presentation. Let's see if we have questions. Um, it's been a difficult question, I think, but very short. Um, uh, your opinion, um, excellent talk, by the way, <laughs> really useful. Um, uh, as a person who is not an artist, but uh, that was into art a little bit, um, you know, my daughter's art. <laughs> um, how much uh, do you think, uh, to what extent do you think an artist is uh, uh, responsible? I, I shouldn't use that word. Uh, I mean, how much do you think the artist belongs to his own art, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the public that he uh, uh, belongs to or uh, speaks to or lives amongst, if you will? Uh, where do you draw the line? Or is there, a, is, there, is there a separation? Well, I tend to, for the most part, believe that you know the art leaves the artist after it's created. That most works of art are um, should you know be read autonomously, so it kind of you know has a world of its own beyond what the artist intended, beyond the artist's um, desired intention for the work. Um, and at the same time, in this in this context, um, this was an artist, you know, who embodied that paradox a little bit because he formally was so interested in this kind of um, figural abstraction that I think lends itself to a reading across time. And I think any of these works are applicable, you know, as much to the time they were created, to a previous time, to the present. Um, and can be thought through in multiple national and international contexts. Um, but then there's clearly, you know, the psychic obsession of Moasis to kind of control um, who had control of his art, art and, and, and not. So, um, I, yeah, I think it's a, a complicated question. Um, but, but Moasis is interesting in the sense that he, he 
stands as sort of um, an anomaly within the art scene of the time in Iran. He is not easily able to be, you know, kind of captured into the national narratives. I mean, there's a huge uh, national project of presenting Iran as um, a, a creator of modern arts. And, and you know, he participated in um, Jashna Honare Shiraz, uh, Iran uh, Shiraz Arts Festival and he was part of these uh, national exhibitions, but he was also always um, incorporating a critique of the state that got him into a lot of trouble throughout his career. Um, so constantly subverting those kind of norms of uh, claiming him. Um, he was not wanting to be claimed as an artist. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for this talk. So I was I was thinking there's like this um, tension I I sort of was picking up on between um, between figural abstraction as uh, basically commenting on sort of a contemporary moment structured by trauma, and so basically there is there a narrative structure to how the artwork is being sort of conceptualized and narrated. And like trauma is something that forces us to be in, be in time and to be historical and how we understand ourselves. So we can think of the 1953 coup as this important moment, both historiographically and in the historical memory. But then there's figural abstraction as a critique of the concept of history that trauma can, that makes trauma intelligible. Mm -hmm. So is, the and, and and so like in your talk too, there is a kind of the word. There's a way in which he is um, sort of creating these artworks that seem anachronistic in a way that bring together many different moments in art history. So you have the sort of um, so you have, for example, the critique of neoclassicism through sculpture, and the way in which or the way in which disfiguration is sort of an implicit critique to the cult of beautiful individuality in the way that we saw with the reception of Picasso in like Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you have the kind of abstraction of like high modernism that's like commentary on like um, like political economy, like Taylorism, and like it's like a line of critique, you know? And so you have these multiple histories that are together, right? So I wonder if, the, so I'm interested about the figure of figural abstraction. Is the figure, like, is the figure of fig figural abstraction a traumatic moment? Right? Is it the traumatic moment, or is it the actual, or is it the concept of history that trauma that, that makes trauma thinkable? Mm -hmm. So this is a way of the artist trying to comment the world while also trying to step outside of it. Right? Mm -hmm. Now I was thinking this like also in terms of like the angel of history, because at the end you were sort of bringing up the sort of all of history is in this sort of mythic figure. But all of history, you can think of all of history in two ways as the history as a singularity of a whole process or as this multiplicity that is, you know, in like the one language, like rhizomatic, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that's basically, so that, so I was wondering if you could reflect on the tension between the kind of, to use this language, the arboreal, right? Or like the way in which abstraction is uh, the, a critique of like our, um, an ar arboreal conception of history and then one in which that is, making us think of like the more rhizomatic. Mm -hmm. There's several questions. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. I mean, one thing I'll say. <laughs> so at the time that um, Moasis is creating these figures, also um, figuration is sort of deemed passe. So you have, I mean, you see in the Sakokhana images, um, you know, these are, I mean, this is still a figure, but you have much more kind of geometric shapes that are becoming much more common as a kind of uh, cubism meets uh, Shia iconography. And um, Moasas is one of the few that kind of wants to maintain the figure. Um, and yet he's still kind of, you know, inspired by abstraction. And I show the image of Mossadegh, um, and it's a tension that I am working through too, is that I'm not interested in saying, okay, the coup happened and then, you know, his art 
form change, he could no longer create these mimetic images because um, the trauma was so severe that you know he had to create this other form. He also created this when he was a teenager. You have to think about this is like his first versus you know then an artist who goes to school and you know learns these various techniques and becomes a much more developed artist. So I I just wanted to remark that not to create that kind of um, you know narrative of trauma and then changed um, you know aesthetic huh this is his homework. yeah this is like you know <laughs> yeah so um, but for me figural um, abstraction it it does become this it's a critical form in which. Um, in which in which something can you know retain the um, the shape and some sem semblance towards um, something legible and knowable um, and and also you know he, he he was very interested in in the human form maintaining um, the human form but then also um, most of his paintings are not marked by any specific uh, geography. There is no um, real kind of national symbolism attributed to it. And so um, the abstraction, you know, is geographic. It's also tied to, to, the, to the figures that he um, incorporates. But I think it, it's each of the, the works themselves carry this kind of critical attention to these, to these various um, concepts and ideas, but also collectively, he's also interested in, you know, being a part of history with a capital H. And that means um, abstraction is also a technique so that, you know, something as an Iranian artist, as an Iranian artist who's shaped by political events, he's also, you know, interested like other 20th century modernists in a kind of international sphere. So um, his critique of authoritarianism is, Ism is not just limited to Iran. It's um, it it extends beyond those kind of territorial uh, designations. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, we can talk. Um, thank you, Donna. That was, that was really interesting and rich uh, presentation. Um, so when you were talking about um, you know Mars's, uh, the, the work that he did uh, being commissioned by the state in the sixties and seventies. Uh, it immediately reminded me of Ibrahim Goristan, mm -hmm. who also in the 60s is commissioned by the state to do, you know, these documentaries about Iranian, uh, you know, the, the jewels of the Iranian gangs and uh, Mojo Marjan. And you've been talking about how, you know, even when he was commissioned by the state, these works were subversive, yeah. right, right? Which was very interesting, right? Um, we like art to be subversive and literature to be subversive, but what does that actually mean concretely? Because at the time, it's, you know, with Godestan too, the movies that he made being commissioned by the state, at the time, he was harshly criticized by his peers for selling out, for working for the coup government, right? But retrospectively, people have argued uh, that these are, you know, make that, that these are very subversive, you know, the works, the last scene from Mojo Mahajan famously, right? Yeah. But, you know, we know that at the time he was harshly criticized, and it uh, it, go to Stan, and it kind of uh, made me wonder if how Mohassis's peers were reacting to his work at the time, right? Are we kind of seeing this uh, subversion retrospectively as part of this you know global um, arts movement, or is there something to it more concretely? Mm -hmm. I mean, there. Fascinatingly, Ala Ahmad describes Moasses as the time at the only one who's making interesting art, which is sort of, I think it's a kind of rich statement, just given that his um, writing in Qarb Zadigi doesn't really seem to align with the kinds of um, imagery that Moasses is uh, creating. But I mean, yeah, no, I think even at the time, Mohasses is creating work that is uh, kind of subversive in relationship to the work of his peers. And I think also the question of sub, uh, being subversive, you know, is it changes. Like you could think of um, these Sakakhana artists, they are subversive on an international scene. You know, they are um, adding something to the modernist canon that um, is incorporating religious motifs and um, 
ancient Persian motifs in a way that we are not seeing in modernist art. So they are, you know, subversive. But Mohasses, um, to be creating work like this at the time is, um, I think, the subversion I'm identifying here is a transcendence of national boundaries for a kind of more um, universal critique. Uh, a critique, here we have perhaps like um, a critique of um, Western imposed standards of modernist art. Um, and here we have a critique, I think, of authoritarianism. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, for this Thank you. <laughs>